Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. We welcome the visitors. We're glad you're here. And you out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. And you in the radio listen audience, if you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in. We'll be a blessing to them, I'm sure. So we work this together in getting out the gospel. Now, if you have your Bible, turn with you please to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, reading verses 18 through 20. I want to speak to you today on this line of thought what we should know about fishing for men. I know Baptists sometimes are pretty, pretty stubborn, pretty hard-headed. Sometimes uh, you can't very well shove them along. But they should be willing to follow the Lord and do what He wants done. I'm reminded of the man dragging a big log chain down the road and someone stopped him and said, Man, what do you mean dragging that chain down the road like this? He said, fella, have you ever seen anybody push one down the road? And so you have a lot of Baptists like that. You like a chain. You can't very well push them. You have to kindly lead them. And I hope that the Spirit of God will help you as you follow the Word of God and the leadership of God's Spirit. If there's ever a time when you need to do what you can for God, it's in this day in which we live. Matthew chapter 4 Verse 18 through 20. And Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now here Jesus called some disciples, apostles, to follow him to be Fishes of men. Now Jesus likened soul winning as to fishing. Now many of you know quite a bit about fishing. You like to go fishing whenever you have the occasion to do so. I never was much of a fisherman. I went one time and caught one about size of my little thing and a lot of little ones. I never could have much luck fishing. Caught one one time. I couldn't tell whether he had hold of the bait or the bait had hold of him. I never figured it out. But sometimes when you fish and catch them like that, you don't go back too often. But some of you are good fishermen, and you know how to fish and catch them. I like it. I should maybe go more during fishing season. I think it's good for anybody to go fishing any day you can except Sunday. You got no business going fishing on Sunday because you're liable to catch the devil. You don't catch him, you're liable to catch a bad cold and take pneumonia and die. So you don't need to go fishing on Sunday. Go through the week. If you can't go through the week, by all means, don't go out on the Lord's Day fishing. It's not right for Christians to do so. Why we should be fishers for men? Now, who can be a fisher of men? Now, keep in mind that fishing for men is soul winning. That's what Jesus here is talking about. He was walking along the shore of Galilee and he saw these men fishing. They did that for a livelihood. And he said, now, fellas, if you leave those nets and follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. We'll go out and catch people for God. We'll go win souls. And he says, I'll make you a fisher of men. Now, you may say, Preacher Edwards, who can be a fisherman? Every true born-again believer, regardless of whether male or female, black or white, red or yellow, regardless of age, you can be a fisher of men if you're saved. Everyone can do that. You may say, now, Preacher Edwards, I just can't very well talk to people. I can't very well uh, witness to anybody. You could if you try. Now, Jesus said this. He said, if you'll follow me, I'll make you a fish of men. Now, he said he'd make you one. He'd show you how to do it. He'd make you a fish of men. And every one of you that's listening to me today that's saved can be a soul winner or a witness for the Lord. 
You can at least tell people how you're saved. You can tell them what God did for you and, and let the Lord save you. And uh, I mean, after he saves you, you can let the uh, Lord help you, give you power to witness. He'll do that. He'll make you fish of men. Everybody can do that. If you've never won a soul to God personally as a Christian, you don't know the real thrill that you would get out of doing so. It's one of the greatest thrills that you'll ever have in your life is to win somebody to Jesus Christ, knowing they'll go to heaven when they die and knowing they won't go to hell. And you never know what it might mean to the family of the person you win to God. Now you may say, preacher, where should we go fishing? Well, the first place to start is in your home. Jesus said on many occasions when he would say to somebody, he'd say, go back home and tell them what great things God's done for you. Start in your home. That's the first place. Now, if you can't catch some fish in your home, then you might have difficulty doing it out in the neighborhood. So you must start in your home and in your neighborhood, on your job, in school as a young person. I've known students to go out and win others to God. Several years ago, we had a couple working with us in evangelism, and they had a boy that went to school and won other students to God in school. Now, that's possible. You can give out tracts, you can witness, and win people to God in school. Now, you must have some uh, bait on your hook. Let me give you that scripture again. The bait for your hook is Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, you can't win anyone to God if they don't have confidence in you. Therefore, you must let your light shine. Now, you can't work around a gang of men and cuss and, and uh, drink beer and uh, tell the filthy jokes and never show any sign of Christianity then turn around and win them to God. You can't do that. That'll backfire in your face. You must live right and do right in order to win people to God, you must have their confidence. That is your bait. If you don't have a bait on your hook, you can't win them to God. If they don't have confidence in you as a Christian, you can't win them to God. You must build up that confidence. Let them see that you're saved, that you love God, and that's the bait on your hook. Then you can help win them to God. Now you not only need bait, but you need equipment you need a, a fishing pole. If you're going out fishing, then you need a pole to put the string and the hook on. Now, it'd be hard to fish without a fishing pole. You know what a fishing pole is. Now, that fishing pole is your faith. In Mark chapter 11, verse 22, Jesus answered, saying unto them, Have faith in God. Now, if you don't have faith in God, you're not going to win anybody to Jesus Christ. I've told you the story how that Yonder in Greenville, South Carolina, many years ago, when I had a gospel tent up there running a tent meeting, a little boy about nine years old came every night. He was saved during the early part of the meeting, and he believed if he could get his mother and dad there, they'd be saved. He had that much faith, and I encouraged him to get them there. He kept on, and finally, on the last night of the meeting, he got them there, and they were gloriously saved. He said, Preach, I knew if I got them here, they'd get saved. Now, he had that much faith. Now, you must have some faith. If you're going to catch men, you must have faith to believe that you can do it and do the job God wants you to do. So you need the pole. You've got to have faith. Secondly, you need a line. Now, you got the pole, and you need a fishing line out there on the end of that pole. Now, without a line, your pole is no good. What could you do with a pole without a line? Fishing. Now that line is your love. You must show forth some love, the love of God in your hearts toward that sinner. Now if you love that sinner, he knows it. If you don't love him, he knows that too. And you'll never win a person to God you manifest some love. You've got to have the line on the pole in order to do it. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, A new covenant I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one to another. So there's no point in you trying to catch fish for God, catch people for God, if you don't let them know that you love them. If you let them know that you love them, I tried one time to drive a person to God. I threatened that person. I told him he's going to hell. God might strike him dead any minute. He's a close relative of mine and 
I was running him further and further away from God. One day I walked up to him, put my arms around him, started weeping and told him I loved him. I wanted to see him get saved. He fell down on his knees and confessed Christ as his Savior. Now you don't drive people to God. You don't make them come to God. You got to love them if you ever get them to God. If they see that you love them, then you have a chance of getting them to God. So you must have uh, the line, the pole, the line. Then number three, you must have a hook. There's no point in having the pole and the line if you don't have a hook on the end of that line. Now that hook is the Holy Spirit. Now when you witness to somebody, it's up to the Holy Ghost to hook him. And he will hook him. He knows how to hook him. You can tell him about Jesus, give your testimony, tell him you ought to be saved, tell him you love him. And then rely on the Spirit of God to hook him. And when the Holy Spirit hooks him... Then you have a good prospect there. You can lead him on to God, but you've got to get the hook in him. The Spirit of God must do that. And you must rely upon the Spirit of God to use the hook, to hook that sinner to get him to God. Now, he does that. He knows how to do it. He can do it, and he will do it. So you must pray when you go out fishing for men. Say, God, I want the Holy Spirit to go with me. I want him to hook somebody for Jesus, and he knows how to do it. Now, on, not only do you need the pole, the line, and the hook, but you need to have a little weight on the end of that line. You can throw that line out there without a little weight on it and float on top of the water. You want to get that hook down where the fish are, and then you got to get it down somewhere enough so you put a weight on your line. And when you put the weight on the line, then it goes down where the fish are feeding or where they are hungry and are looking for feed. Now, that weight is your prayer. When you go fishing, you must pray that God will give you power, give you weight enough and influence enough to be able to reach that person for him. Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, Brother, my heart desire to God and prayer to God is for Israel that they might be saved. Paul said I could die and go to hell if it meant Israel would be saved. He prayed every day and every night that they might be saved. Now through much prayer... You can catch men for God. If you don't do some prayer, never go fishing for men until you first get on your knees and talk to God about it. Not only do you need that weight, but in order to catch the fish, you've got to have some bait on the end of that hook. You can't drop a, just a dry hook down there, a naked hook, and expect a fish to bite it. You've got to have some bait. Now that bait is the gospel. You'll never get a person saved until you give him the gospel, the word of God. John chapter 12 and verse 32, he said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men unto me. Give the man the gospel. Tell him Jesus died for him, was buried and rose again. God loves him. Romans chapter 10 and verse 7, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you don't have some bait on that hook, you might as well go home. If you don't give that person some uh, testimony with the word of God, and if you don't give him the scriptures, you'll never reach him for God. We had in our Sunday school lesson this morning. Well, the word of God is sharp, powerful, sharp, and a two-edged sword. You need it. The Bible says, He that goeth forth weeping, so in precious seeds shall no doubtless come again rejoice and bring the sheaves with him. You must have the word of God. You must have the bait that is the word of God. And then, of course, there's some uh, essential necessities for going fishing. There's certain things you must do. Number one, you must have the courage to do so. It takes courage to walk up to a man and tell him about Jesus. You may tremble in your boots. You may quiver in your voice. But, beloved, you've got to have some courage, and there's rough places. I went fishing some time ago with a deacon down in the Charleston, South Carolina. I was there in this church in a meeting, and, and he caught some fish, but in the roughest places I've ever seen, a fisherman go, but he caught the fish. The people went to the smooth places, didn't catch any, but he caught them. He knew where they were. And he went to some rough places. So there may be some rough places. It may be a hard man to witness. He may be mean as the devil. But he needs God. He's going to hell. Then there must be tactfulness. You've got to be tactful. You can't walk up and buttonhole a man, shake him real good and say, if you don't get saved, buddy, you're going to hell. You won't get him to God like that. You've got to be tactful in getting him to God. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of woods, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. When you go out so when you don't beat people to God, drive them to God, you just don't do that. There's a man some time ago, a, 
I heard a preacher the other week telling about his wife, uh, a man's wife, wanted to ride the, uh, the bus uh, uh, to church, and uh, the church bus, and her husband said, you're not going to uh, church today, and, and she said, I am going to ride that bus. He said, you're not going to, she said, I'm going to do it. And she got on the bus and came to church and she told the preacher, said, my husband didn't want me to come to church today, but said, I, I picked up a frying pan and busted him upside the head and knocked him cold as a cucumber. And I left him laying there knocked out and I come on to church. Well, it might be kind of hard to uh, win that man to God. Now, you just don't hardly win him like that. You got to do it a different manner. And she was walking around there praising God. She come to church all right. Now, you need to realize there's a better way to win people to God than knocking their head with a frying pan. Some of them might need knocking in the head, but that's not the way that you win them to God. You've got to be tactful. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 2, Far bear them record that they have a zeal of God not according to knowledge. You've got to have this zeal according to knowledge if you win a man to God. In Romans chapter 14, verse 6, Let not your good be evil spoken of. You can't walk around and, and uh, say you're a Christian and do the same thing the world is doing and expect to win that man to God. Then you've got to have some patience. My wife doesn't like to go fishing. You know why she doesn't like to go fishing for a fish? She says she don't have the patience to sit there and wait for them to bite. Well, you've got to have patience if you go fishing. My precious mother, who's in heaven today, she could get a fishing pole and sit on a riverbank all day long if she didn't get a nibble, she had sat there. Now, she had patience. Now, you've got to have patience. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Sit there long enough to catch that fish. Maybe about the time you pull your hook out, he comes up ready to bite. So don't give up on people. Keep on trying to win them to God. You must do that. And so if you'll uh, uh, be faithful and have patience, then you can win people to God. Now, there's different species of fishes to be caught. Now, there's the old eel. Do you ever see an eel? An eel looks like a snake to me. He's slip, a slippery fish. He's hard to hold to. And he'll slip out of your hands if you're not careful. Now, you might catch an eel once in a while. We have a lot of eels in our, our church pond. Every once in a while, I watch them whenever Sunday school over. They slip out, you know. They... Uh, they're slippery, they slip out, and they're gone. They won't stay for preaching. A lot of times I watch these eels, when the choir goes down, they slip on out, and they're gone. A lot of times when they ought to be in the choir, they slip in late, too late to come to the choir. Now, beloved, listen, you can be an eel church member, very slippery, and you're hard to hold when you're like that. Right when you need it, you slip out. You can't um, be depended on. Now, God wants somebody he can depend on, Old Thomas, he was a doubter. He was an eel-type church member. He'd slip in a case. He'd slip out and slip around and slip in and slip out. Now, you need to stay put. If there's ever a time when you need to find your place at the post of duty and be faithful in the work of God, it's now. If every church member was unconcerned about getting to his job and doing his job, as every church member is about being faithful in God's house, then you'd lose your job before the week's out. You know that. Now, God should be first and put him first and be prompt and, and be on the ball, so to speak, for the Lord. So there's the eel. And then there's the old mudfish. Now, that mudfish like to stay in the mud. You know, the prodigal son went down to the hog pen. He had a good home, had some good food, needed a good shelter, good clothing, good fellowship. But he decided to leave home and he went down and End up at the hog pen eating to feed the hog ate. Now he was a mud fish, the old carp. That old carp fish likes to lay around in the mud. Now you have a lot of church members like that. They never try to clean up for God. You can't get out there and, uh, and uh, try to win a man to God if you're not the right kind of person in your approach and so forth in your dress. You need to uh, try to be prompt and clean in order to win a man to God, a person to God. Now you have the old mud fish today. They don't care how they act, how they look, what they do, what kind of habits they have, where they go, and they just float around in the mud. Well, you don't catch fish as a, as a Christian doing that. You have that kind today. And then you have the old catfish. Now that catfish, he's a type fish when you cut his head off, you don't have much left. That old catfish is a lazy fish. 
Now you have a lot of lazy fish, and a lot of them listen to me right now, sitting at home too lazy to get up and get the children dressed and go to Sunday school and church because they're too lazy. They like the old catfish. And then, in all, then to the old catfish is a type fish that the biggest thing about him is his mouth. Now you see some church members like that today, but the biggest thing about them is their mouth. They're always running off at the mouth and running out of gear at the mouth and, and really never saying anything. You know, an old rattle trap, an empty wagon, will make far more noise than one that's loaded. Do you know that? A man that's all mouth has got all the answers that can tell you what the answer is before you get it out of your mouth and knows everything, usually knows nothing. And like a catfish, the biggest thing about him or her is their mouth. Have you seen people like that? I know some preachers, bless their hearts. They could be doing a job for God today if they hadn't having a catfish. And mouths are big until uh, uh, their mouth learned their ministry. Now there's some preachers like that. I, I know a preacher right now on the downward float because of his mouth. His church is not doing too good. He runs his mouth all the time. And, and uh, nobody can get to where edge ways. And, and he knows it all. Got all the answers. And it's not helping him. Now don't be all mouth and think you know it all. Give somebody else credit for knowing a little something. There was a preacher some time ago that did all the talking. If you was ever around him, he never shut up. He just talked all the time. And, and he took this church and one of the uh, members went down and paid him a visit and left. And going up the street and met one of the deacons. He said to the deacon, he said, I went down and talked with Pastor so-and-so a while. He said, you went down and listened to Pastor so-and-so a while. And so there's a time for all of us to maybe do a little talking. And, but the old catfish is all mouth. Oh, they know it all. Yeah, they can tell you what's right and what's wrong. Got all the answers. Never see their own faults. Just big mouthed all the time. Did you, do you know the Bible said study to be quiet? You know that was in the Bible? Study to be quiet. Mind your own business. There's a fellow one time, he didn't talk too much. He was a Tassadon type fellow. And he uh, didn't say very much. And uh, somebody asked him, said, uh, fellow, said, I noticed you don't get in on the conversation around here too much. You're not talking to me. He said, well, I, I figured as long as I didn't say anything, people might know, uh, figure I might know something. But said, as soon as I start talking, they'll know immediately I don't know anything. But a lot of poor catfish church members, they just rattle, rattle, rattle. And it's not long till they give themselves away. They prove they don't know anything. And then there's the flander. That flander has eyes on two eyes on one side of his head, just on one side. Now you have a fish like that today in the church. They just see one way, that's all. They can just see it their way. Nobody else has any ideas. Nobody else knows the way but them. They just look at one side, that's all. Just one way, look in one direction. That old flounder, if you look at him, you got both eyes, just looking one way. Now people like that got a one-track mind. Now, you need to take in consideration that there's two sides to everything. You know, a lot of people don't know that. They think there's only one side, and that's the side that they uh, think's right. They, there's no two sides to anything they don't think. But if they ever turn and look around them, they'll find there's two sides to everything. And so don't be like the old flounder. Just have eyes on one side of your head. And then there's the old, um, old toadfish. Now, sometimes he's called the old blowfish, and when he comes up the top of the water, he'll just kind of blow up. You ever see these old uh, toadfish just blow up over nothing? I, I'm not going. I'm not going to do my job no more. I, I because I don't like what the preachers say. I'm. I'm. I'm not, I won't be there. I just. Uh, I'm gonna quit because uh, I just don't. Uh, don't like the way it's done. I don't like. Uh, I, I'm not going. I'm gonna sing in the choir because I don't like a song leader. I'm. I'm not going to do this, you know. That's the old uh, toadfish always blowing up about something. Now, if you blow up about every little thing that comes along, then you're the loser. You're most certainly the loser. You shouldn't be a, a toadfish, and every th time something doesn't come along that suits you or just right, blow up about it. That's the wrong attitude to take. You must remember there's more than one side to everything, and you need to keep that in mind. So don't be like the elder brother. The elder brother came home and they were having a party for the younger brother. And the old elder brother blowed up out there behind the barn, wouldn't go in, wouldn't eat. And he was invited in. His father went out and tried to get him to come on. And oh, no, 
You didn't pitch a party for me. You didn't kill the fatted calf for me. You didn't, you didn't do for me what you did for him. And he went off down yonder and, and spent his money on harlots and lived in sin. And, and he's come back home. And, and now you pitched a party for him. And I've been here all the time. You haven't done it for me. I'm not coming in. Now, who was the loser? He was. He was a loser. There's beef steak there for him. He could enjoy the music. He could have been in the house, enjoyed the party, but he blowed up. He was a, a toadfish, and, and he just blowed up over the situation. At any time a church member blows up about anything, they are the losers. There's no sense in it. Always a way to solve every problem. There's no problem what can't be solved if it's done through prayer and through wisdom and consideration. It can be solved. But any time a church member blows up about something, then they're the loser and God's work suffers because of it. Now then, there's the old jellyfish. Now the jellyfish is a fish with no backbone. You have a lot of people don't have any backbone. A lot of people don't have any backbone. That's pitiful. You need a backbone for God. In these days, you need one as big as a saw log. You men ought to have a backbone in your home. A lot of men so hidden packed until they don't have any authority in their home, and that's pathetic. Some women say, well, I, my husband, he, he, he don't know how to do anything. He doesn't know how to run business. He doesn't know how to handle the house. Well, you married him. You married him. But he's supposed to be the head of your house. If you married him, you ought to consider that because God's going to hold him responsible for his household. You may say, my husband, he, he's kind of dumb. He, he's a dumb kind of fellow. I have to take care of all the business and run all the affairs. Well, you married the dumb fellow. What would you marry him for? You need to realize that he was to be the head of the house when you married him. And so remember then, you have the jellyfish, no backbone fish, don't have any backbone, any courage to stand up for anything. And you have those kind. And then you have the old crawfish. Now that crawfish, you know, he has some peaches out there. You've seen old crawfish. And if he can get you in his peaches, he, he'll try to hurt you. Well, you have a lot of people like that. If they can... Uh, uh, get their pinches around you, then they'll, they'll try to hurt you. Now you need to realize and beware of that crawfish lest he gets his pinch around you and then he can go back with his face he can forward. Now these crawfish chase members, they just may be backslid next week and come crawling up next Sunday and back off the next week. Now you got to have some backbone and, and uh, set your aim and go forward and not back up and Go a little way and back up and go and back up. Then you keep going forward. God said go forward in his business. So you have the, the old crawfish. You know, Lot's wife, she looked back and got into trouble. And then finally, there's the goldfish. The goldfish is a thing of beauty. It's very graceful. And we all love a beautiful little goldfish. You've seen them in the homes. They're very graceful. They swim very graceful. And we like little goldfish. Now, God wants us to be a goldfish, be graceful, be active, be something that's appreciated. And every one of us can be a goldfish for God. Jesus said, you follow me, and I'll make you a fish of men. Now, I have this message on cassette tape. If it didn't sink in, get the tape and listen to it. And you in the radio listen audience, this tape is number 214, number 214. And you can write in for it. The title... What we should know about fishing for men. And God wants us to be fishes of men. And if you have never caught a person for God, you have missed out on the greatest thrill other than salvation, the fullness of the Spirit could ever come to you. It's when you win somebody to God. I'll never forget the first man I went on to Jesus. Oh, how thrilled I was. It's like a lion getting a taste of blood. I set out to get more. And try to win somebody to God and you'd be so thrilled that you did. Thank you. What kind of fish are you? You ought to know. But stand up. Dear Father, today I pray that you take the message and use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored and may Jesus be glorified. All we say do, God, make us. Make us fishes of men. Help us to catch men for God. We know the pond is full. There's millions going to hell. And help us to get them for thee. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now Debbie's going to play for us. And she plays. 
If you're here and you need to come forward for any reason, salvation, rededication, join the church, any reason, you come while she plays, will you? Come down here and let us help you. We want to help you.